It is Friday. Ha! Huh. The Sabbath is approaching in a few hours. And I reflect on the song, O oh, Day of Rest and Gladness. What a day it will be when we worship God live and direct in his very presence. And so this week we looked at the topic, Worshiping the Creator. And we're so happy this morning, this Friday morning on Whispering Hope to have Pastor Orville Joseph, who will help us to unpack this week's lesson, Worshiping the Creator. So we want to say welcome to Pastor Joseph, and then we're going to ask him to pray for us, and then we will jump into our discussion for today. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be able to join you this morning for our final installment of this week's lesson. It has been a joy uh, sharing with you. Whispering Hope is always pleased and excited about the fact that you have joined that you join us every morning for the week. And when it comes Friday, we always look forward in anticipation again to begin the week with you. So again, may God bless you as you share with us this morning the study for today. All right. So we're going to invite you now to pray. Okay, gracious God and all loving Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your grace. We exalt you and give you praise because you're worthy. Father, have mercy upon us. Forgive us of our sins. Um, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This morning I pray that you will bless your people in a very special way. Whatever their situations, I pray that they will find relief and joy and comfort and assurance in you. May their hope be buoyed and may they have a desire to continue to deepen their relationship with you until that day when you usher in your kingdom. Bless us and keep us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worshiping the Creator. You know, Pastor Joseph, what is your understanding of the word worship? Worship is entering into an experience that acknowledges and, and exalts and, and prays the one who is creator, the one who is our sustainer, the one who ensures our our salvation. Worship is engaging in any activity that, that puts God first. You know, that God is first and foremost, that God is central. Above him, there is no other. It draws from you a strong desire and appreciation, but also adoration for who God is. Amen. You know, every week we look at our memory text, and it comes from Revelation 4, 11. And it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Do you care to tell us what is John telling us in this text? Clearly, John is reminding us, as the, the host declare, that God is worthy to receive honor and praise and glory. Why? Because he is creator of all things. Uh, you know, and that's the part that gets me excited about this text, because the text doesn't limit God. I, I know later on in the, the first angel's message, it calls for worshiping God that created the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. But by here, the heavenly beings declare that, hey, listen, God created all things. Uh, we, we're not even going to list all of them, but they are the, the result of the creative work of God. And we ought to come to recognize that. I think that as children of God, the result of his creation, the crowning glory of his creation, that we ought to stop and give him praise and honor and glory. And that is how we ought to be as, you know, Isaiah, in his picture of, of the heavenly beings in, in Isaiah chapter 6, see them veiling their faces and praising God. And at the very praise of these heavenly beings, the, the very building of the temple shakes. I would to God that we would praise God so vigorously and so excitedly that the temple in which we worship would literally shake because of the praise that we give to God. 
Amen. You know, worship. Who do we worship? Seems to be a contest in this world for worship. And, you know, I always take us back to the 40 days fast of Jesus after his baptism, where the enemy, where Satan tried to get him to worship him. You know, before him, he would have paraded all the metropolitan cities of the world at the time and offered it to Christ and say, this I will give you if you will worship me. And so we must recognize just how important worship is. And God requires it of us, but even the enemy wants worship. And so it's very very, very important that we recognize why we worship the creator. And so I want you to dwell more on this idea of why in a fallen world, being created by God is not enough. Why do we need the promise of redemption as well? Okay. So uh, it's not just enough for something to be brought into existence you know something comes into existence it has to be sustained it has to be kept up it has to have some connection and we're talking about human beings in terms of our relationship with god but the question makes the point of us being fallen that the world that we live in and we ourselves are fallen human beings and if we are fallen then we are in need of restoration i just I'm reflecting on the fact that you have a very expensive vase in your house and, and you hit against the cabinet and it, it falls, it falters and, and begins to fall. You do everything possible to save it from falling. And, and sometimes you might even break the fall. You might even break the fall, but it might get a chip here or there. But you go out and make the effort to be able to put that that chipped area back together by by gluing it all putting it back in place etc because of the value that you place on on the vase well we were created by god perfect and he declared that you know it was very good we fell created chaos and the only thing that god could do is to restore us back to where we were Hence, it is important for us to recognize, one, that we are not who God created us to be originally in terms of our, our faithfulness to him, in terms of our purity in his presence, in terms of being affected by sin. We have been affected by sin. And so we need to recognize that. And so we have the choice to move back to the point where we allow Jesus Christ to recreate us. Uh, we like to say, creating me a clean heart, as the, the psalmist says, and renew that right spirit within me. When you come to the point where you recognize that you're fallen, you're broken, you are, you are not who you ought to be, then the only person who can fix you is Jesus Christ. You know, we always also make the allusion to the fact that the manufacturer of a uh, an automobile or of an equipment is best suited to say what what are the genuine parts and what it is that you need to do to that machine in order for the machine to run well have longevity as it were and give you long years of service and so it is with us in our lives we need god who is our creator to be there for us because he has the manual as to how we can survive through all of the challenges difficulties and failures of life and in that manual it says that one of the ways that god will employ to restore us is to for his son to die and be the sacrifice that offers redemption to us and, and so we celebrate that fact that not only are we created in God's image, but that God is committed to recreate us so that we can be renewed in his image again. Praise the Lord. You know, Pastor Joseph, think about some experience in which you unmistakably saw the power of God in your life. That is in a way that showed you God's love for you personally and then dwell on the fact 
that this is God who created the entire cosmos. And this God loves you enough to care about your life. Why should this reality not only be comforting, but also humbling? I could talk about the experience of, of this very weekend where God transitions is transitioning me from one call to another and how challenging that can be, especially in the atmosphere where people have expectations and those expectations are not met. But yet still God remains a constant, a supporter, that God remains a guide, one who opens up way, creating new vision and pathway for you. Whereas you might have been focused on what you might be able to do and accomplish in, on one end. Now God gives you a vision of what you can do in another area. I mean, I've seen God work for me. I remember some years ago, not too long ago, we were transporting some cheers to Gilbert's and we were packing the, the chuck and I was trying to climb up on the chuck and I missed the landing and landed on, on the concrete like that. And I mean, the way I landed, it seems as if all the bones in my body was broken, but thank God nothing happened. You know, I, I did have to go to the hospital. The, the x-ray turned out well. It turned out it didn't have much to worry about. And I, for me, it is only the mercy and goodness of God that allowed that to happen. I thank God for his love, for his divine protection, for Shile. I've seen that over my decades of life, how God has come through, how God has been there. And that is why I'm trying my endeavor best to keep on being faithful to him. As we dwell on this fact, we ought to be reminded that the God that we love will not allow us to suffer. And when I say suffer, I am talking in the context of being annihilated by any, any force or any agency or, you know, no matter what it is. I, I was reflecting over the last few hours on the promise that God gives to us when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to our redemption. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews 12 makes the point that that jesus is the starter and the finisher of our faith and a lot of people struggle with their faith in terms of how they're able to embrace a god that is there for them who loves them who cares for them who protects them you know many times a lot of people because they are not sure how to move from their situation to somewhere else. They don't want to even start. But God says, hey, listen, the starting process is not even yours. I take responsibility for that. So just let go and allow me to get you started because if I get you started, it's going to be all right. And the beautiful assurance that we can cherish in that is that God says, I will get you started. But he also says, I will help you finish, which it's joy to the heart to know that when you start out on that race, even if you get thirsty, tired, whatever it is, God promises that he's going to finish the race. He's going to help you finish the race or he's going to finish the race for you. And so he's saying, don't, don't even give up. Don't even falter. Don't even try to, to give in because in the very end, I am the one who guarantees that you're going to be successful. You're going to make it all. And that is why it is important for us to be able to embrace that thought. That is why we ought to humble ourselves. And that is why we ought to be submissive, to let God take control. Because God has our interest at heart. You know, you might come into a car with me and I, I might be driving at, at a speed that allows you to be scared and you would need to be scared because one, you can't trust the machinery. Two, you can't trust human agency. But God says, hey, listen, if you get into a car with me and I am the driver, it doesn't matter how dangerous it seems, you can rest assured that I will get you safely to the end of the journey. And that is why we ought not to worry or fret because God is in control. Amen. Very profound indeed. And so another question. Now this week we look at worshiping the creator and we also look at the counterfeit evolution. So the question is, if evolution were true, think about how we would be called to worship a creator who used billions of years of debt, violence, destruction, suffering, and mass extinction in order to create us. 
while at the same time giving us a completely different story in Genesis about how we were created. And yet we are supposed to be worshipping him. Worship him for what? For lying to us for thousands of years about how we got here to begin with? Tell me, what's your thought? <laughs> yeah, it's always one of those amazing things about the the whole evolutionary process um, and even those who adhere to to what they refer to but those who still want to hold on to the bible and say the bible gives us the leeway also latitude the latitude to, to make the argument that the earth could have been created over thousands of, of years well god says hey, listen i did it on day one i did it on day two i did it on day three and if he didn't do it that way then he would have lied to us the other thing is that evolution is saying that through the process of arriving where we are, there is a process of the survival of the fittest. In other words, we have to fight and wrestle with each other, or as it were, those our prehistoric ancestors uh, would have had to struggle in order for the best to emerge which seems to be a gruesome process to arrive at what you want you finally want but and the thing about it is that god claims that he is all powerful he claims that he is omniscient and therefore if you are all powerful why do you need all that horrendous terrible process in order to arrive at something good okay what it says is that god needs help in perfecting, in perfecting his creation. And certainly that is not the kind of God that we that we serve. That's not the kind of God that we rely on. That's not the kind of God that we have come to know. That is not the kind of God that is revealed in scripture. And so evolution makes a liar out of God. And that is why I think I said last, earlier in the week, that you can't really believe evolution and still believe the bible they're diametrically opposed to each other god is creator of all things he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood fast seven seven literal days he took to create earth and mankind and initiated a rest that would be a reflection of his creative work and process. And so if God calls me to remember the seventh day as a day that reflects his creative work, certainly that in itself again flies in the face of reason. Because why is he calling me weekly to remember a weekly creation that never really existed? And so the beauty about it is that, again, God is our creator. And I believe all and I affirm that it was seven days, 24 hour day, from sunset to sunset, that God used to create the heaven and the earth. Amen. You know, I had this discussion earlier this week, but I'm going to say it again. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than to believe in creation. This bang, this one cell amoeba that divided and, you know, over billions of years we are existing. And according to the theorists of evolution that we came from monkeys, then why are they still monkeys? How come for the amount of time that we are on earth that we are yet to change to something else? And uh, where did this material, this one cell amoeba came from to begin with? You understand? The matter that existed that somehow turned into this beautiful as with all the blight and with all the dregs of sin that we can see. Where did this matter come from? Where? And so <laughs> the, the, the mastermind behind evolution really is the enemy. Any doubts that he can place in our minds about our creator, our God, who is also our sustainer. Just a little doubt. And he wins. We see what he did in the Garden of Eden. And these are the theories. They don't make any sense. Where did the matter, the parts of the world that pre-existed, where it come from? And so 
we as seven day adventists must talk about our creator god the intelligent design this world did not come about by chance and these are things that we need to be highlighting the creation story as you say pastor George, the seven literal days in the beginning god created not no in the beginning bang because then it means that we live our lives in fear wondering what's gonna take our planet out and so it really 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 gives us hope that we serve a god who's not only our creator but also our redeemer and so I'm going to ask you for your takeaway from this week's lesson, worshiping the creator. You can go from Friday or any day of the week that you prefer. And then we will close off this discussion for the week. Certainly this week reminds us that we cannot just go on and live callously, but we need to give regard to the one who made it possible for us to be here in the very instance. Um, we pay homage and respect to our parents. We're having Mother's Day coming this weekend. Uh, you know, we're celebrating the fact that a woman gave birth to us and we have life and we can aspire and we can accomplish and we can work. I want to see in a similar context that God is saying, hey, celebrate the fact that I made all things possible. And I like the whole process of creation where God on day one is setting the stage, putting things in place so that one day supports the other day and the other day until finally man is created and what man needs for sustenance is also provided. And that being... Our eternal God needs to be celebrated for who he is. He needs to be celebrated for what he has done. He needs to be celebrated for what he continues to do. So as you reflect on the fact that you have had a mother who gave birth to you, who nurtured you, cuddled you, raised you, counseled you, and most of us will reflect this weekend on some salient point that our mother would have said to us and uh, some counsel, some phrase, you know, that she would have said that, but reminds us and calls us to reflect on the fact that we ought to live circumspectly. We ought to be behave differently. We ought to be industrious or we ought to be religious or we ought to have a relationship with God. We will remember our mother for that. By God's grace, let us remember our heavenly father for the fact that he created us, that he empowers us, that he gave us stewardship over the universe. Um, and as we remember him, may we give him the praise that he deserves. Oh, you won't be able to give him a fruit basket or a flower bouquet. You won't be able to give him a holiday vac vacation at Sandals, you know, or the Hilton. But you can give him praise and he is excited about that he inhabits the praises of his people we are told and so he wants that give it to him this weekend give it to him every day give it to him every week and may god bless all of us as we continue to praise him what he has done and for who he is okay this morning we want to respond to a very special prayer request and that's why we're doing it a little separate from the introductory prayer. And so at this time, I'm going to invite you to kindly bow your heads as we pray. Gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we come this morning interceding because you've asked us that whatever concern we have, we can bring it before you. And you are open to our cry. Uh, today, we want to present you little JLA, Logan, Taylor. She has encountered an accident at home that has caused her to lose two of her fingers and, and she's in critical condition, kind father. And we just want to place her in your hand because we know that you're the great physician. We want to place her in your hand because you know 
that you take care of all of our needs. We are asking for your divine intervention, that you will be there with her, that you will strengthen her, that you'll keep her. But most of all, that you'll be able to work with the doctors and the nurses in order to perhaps reattach those thumbs and, and, and finger. And we pray that everything will go well. And if perchance that it is not your desire, but that she functions in a certain way, that we pray that you'll give her strength and you'll, you'll prepare her psychologically but Father, today our cry, our prayer request is for you to restore her, make her whole again, and we claim this promise that you have given to us, that whatever we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, you will give it to us, uh, that whatever we agree on, you will cause it to happen. Uh, you, you say you will never leave us nor forsake us. You say you will ever be present with us. You say that you will ever um, be with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I pray, oh God, that you will be with the families of this young lady and that you will bless them, strengthen them and give them hope. And may they keep trusting in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Joseph, again, we want to thank you for sharing with us here on Whispering Hope this Friday morning. You know, we looked at worshiping the Creator. The truth is, we all worship somebody. Voluntarily or involuntarily. Who do you worship? And why do you worship him? These are fundamental questions that we all have to answer individually. When you think of where we came from, we go to Genesis 1, 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 3, 15 tells us about it, prophecy of God coming in to redeem us the serpent being bruised you know so we all were condemned to die for the wages of sin is death but john 3 16 said for god so loved us that he gave his only begotten son this only begotten son this is this is our redeemer is also our creator so one he made us. And then two, he redeemed us. He brought us back. And the ultimate question is why? And I will tell all of Whispering Hope because he loves us. John 3, 16 rings true. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe? That's the question. And if you are struggling to believe, pray and ask God to remove unbelief. He says he stands at your heart door and he's knocking. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Just simply open and he will come in and sup with you. Have a wonderful day. Happy Sabbath when it comes along later. And see you tomorrow on Whispering Hope. God bless.